Hey guys, welcome back. Skitzone series, episode 28. Topic today is a good one. It's going to be perspective projections. We covered a few episodes ago parallel projections, which I think are better for most things. Um, usually you want perspective only if you are making a game or doing kind of some kind of scene rendering. Usually for engineering stuff, you want a parallel projection, in my experience. Um, but there is some use for this. Uh, we're going to use a depth buffer to do this. Previously, we had to implement some kind of weird centroid distance checking thing. Um, but with a depth buffer, we could actually track how deep objects are on the screen and then only draw things that are closer to us than what we've already drawn. So if we end up drawing something in the foreground and we find something in the background that's in the same pixel, we won't draw that, you know, because it's hidden behind the foreground object. Uh, also in this video, we'll talk about what's called barycentric coordinates, which is one way of interpolating between vertex values on a triangle. And we're going to use that A for color interpolation, like you see here, but also for the depth computation, because we have to use that for our depth buffer. So as an example, um, here is example B today. I'll give you a preview. You can see here a cross. It's a 2D cross, it would seem, with a gradient color scheme. Um, between the vertices, but in reality, it's a 3D cross, and there's a cube hiding behind this. And so, kind of can see as I swing it around, there is some, some sense of field of view and depth, because now the cube is bigger, it would seem, uh, than the cross, at least bigger than it was before. So, we'll talk about how this works today. A lot goes into this. It took me a few weeks to get this to work, so I hope you enjoy. Okay. back to the slides. So I mentioned this briefly in the beginning. Uh, what's the difference between orthographic or parallel projection and a perspective projection? Um, for what's called orthographic or parallel projections, everything is the same size if it's the same size in the projection. So everything is project parallel to your view direction. Um, so there's no sense of things being further away or closer in that sense. So distances are preserved in the depth direction. Uh, alternatively, perspective projections are basically, you can see here, um, near field ar objects are larger relative to the far field objects. So yeah, pretty simple. Um, usually for CAD type stuff, engineering type stuff, you use a parallel projection method because it doesn't kind of distort and skew the image. Um, whereas for games and for CGI, you want things that are more similar to the way we see things with our own eyes, which would mean like, you know, perspective projections. So how does that work? Well, basically, you have a viewer you can see here in pink, and a field of view um, with some kind of focal length, which is a distance to a view plane. And the idea is, you take everything, perhaps everything beyond the view plane, if you want, um, and you basically project all those things along a vector from that thing to the viewer's eye. And wherever that hits the view plane, that's basically what you draw. So you can see here I have like a red, a white, and an orange object, and I'm tracing their endpoints towards the viewer and where they intersect this green view plane line um, I basically draw, you can see here on the green line, uh, red, white, and orange lines. And this is what the viewer would actually see, you know, from their eye, not in a top-down sense. And it's a very simple math. I mean, you can see here, it's just triangles and multiplication and dot products. So it's not very hard at all to do this. And here's the math of how this works. Um, just for one direction, the X direction. Imagine you're looking top-down at this whole scene. So O is where the viewer is, A is your point of interest, and uh, you know again F is that focal length towards the view plane. Um, and so basically you're interested in this X prime and Y prime coordinates, which is basically the position on the screen of the object that you're projecting. So this point A, if you project it towards the viewer, it uh, occurs X prime away from basically the center of this axis. 
and that axis center is basically half the screen width, half the screen height. That's dead center on the screen. So to do that, just similar triangles, you can see uh, x prime is to f as x is to d. And so you have to be able to compute x and d. So what is x? x is just the vector from o to a dotted with the uh, one magnitude vector ux. So basically this component of this is in obviously this direction. That's the whole idea. Similarly, you can get the z component um, in order to compute d. But either way, x prime is related to all these three things here. Uh, so it's very simple to compute basically the screen coordinates of a given point as long as you have a definition for this ux, uy, uz axis system as well as a sense of where this a is relative to this o and also perhaps this focal length defined. Pretty simple stuff. Um, now for that depth, as I mentioned before, it's just very similar to this x quantity. Depth is just the vector from O to A dotted with the z direction right here. And again, this is a one magnitude quantity, so ux, uy, uz. Um, and in this way, you can define how, some, how far something is from the viewer. And so the way I've defined things with basically Z coming towards the viewer, um, so UX is to the right, UY is up, UZ is towards the viewer from the view plane, basically in this direction. Um, that basically means that the depth of everything is negative, assuming it's behind the view plane. And the depth of infinity here, you know, far away, is actually negative infinity. And so we'll use that for our depth buffer in a second. So what is the point of computing this d value besides just evaluating x prime that is <laughs> right here in this equation what's the point of computing d well d is basically a way of understanding how far an object is from the viewer so imagine we had another point call it b out here well this b is at the same basically spot as A was on the view plane. However, B has a larger depth from the viewer than uh, point A would. And so in that case, between points B and point A, if they would otherwise be coincident on our screen right here, we're gonna end up plotting the one that's nearer to the viewer. Obviously, that's the orange one, that's point A. So you need to compute the depth in order to evaluate how far something is from the viewer, and also to compute basically X prime and also y prime. So to get the depth, um, that's pretty straightforward. But uh, the first step is to keep track of what was the depth before. And so originally, what we're going to do is create this depth buffer. We're going to initialize basically a width by height array, essentially in memory. Uh, it'll be linear, but we'll pretend it's like a rectangle like this. And we'll fill that array with negative infinity in every single pixel slot. So all you know, width by height pixels will have a value of negative infinity. And so whenever we want to draw a pixel, we'll say, okay, I want to draw a pixel 100, 100, maybe right here. What is the current value in the depth buffer at that location? If it's you know further away from the viewer than our current pixel that we're trying to plot, we'll then create draw the current pixel on top of that pixel and then replace the value in the in the depth buffer with the current depth so let's just say we went back to this example here at the top um, point a let's say that was the only point you wanted to draw well your depth buffer would initially be all minus infinities and so you check hey point a what is the x prime and y prime coordinates for that you'd find that somewhere on the screen you'd say what is the current depth buffer quantity at that pixel location, it would end up being minus infinity. And so then you'd say, okay, well, guess what? This depth, call it negative 10 or something, that number is greater than negative infinity. And so I will plot the pixel color of A, in this case, orange, at that location. And then I will replace that value in the depth buffer with the new depth at that pixel, which is negative 10. 
So pretty straightforward, I imagine. Okay, so the next big thing about this is this idea of barycentric coordinates for vertex interpolation. So the way this works is, if you recall, um, everything that we draw is a triangle. Essentially, all the solids that we draw are triangles, and each triangle has obviously three vertices. And generally speaking, each vertex can have a different depth from the viewer. Uh, and you have to be able to know what is the depth of every pixel on the triangle if you're going to use a depth buffer, right? So how do you compute the depth of all the vertices in this triangle when you plot it? Well, you might know the vertex depth of this vertex and this vertex and this vertex. And of course, there are ways you could linearly interpolate this uh, yourself, but one very easy and very relevant way to do that is uh, with barycentric coordinates. So the way this works is basically you use these coordinates which allow you to represent each pixel in the triangle or even potentially outside the triangle as a linear combination or basically a three-part proportion to each vertex. So here's how that idea looks. So you have this triangle here and you have a set of three coordinates that define pretty much wherever you are in this two-dimensional plane. The plane of the triangle, that is. Uh, and so you can see here at the top, this point is 1, 0, 0. That is, it's 100% towards this point. Uh, and then this point down here is 0, 1, 0. So it's 0% 0 to this point, 100% toward this point, and 0% toward this point. Similarly, here in the middle, you can see this point is half this point, half this point, and 0% this point. And then in the very middle, you can see this point is one third each of the points. So pretty sensible way to do this. And by the way, there are other ways that you can detect whether or not a pixel is within the triangle's edges, um, you know, with like cross products and stuff. But uh, one way you could do it if you were very lazy is just by checking these coordinate values because you know if the coordinates of each index here are greater than or equal to zero that you are inside the triangle. Okay. Um, one other way, which is very important actually to how we're gonna drive this, um, that these coordinates can be understood is basically as area fractions of each of these sub-triangles. So let's say you were to pick point P for this triangle A, B, C, and you wanted to figure out, well, what are my coordinates in this barycentric system. Well, basically, this is it. So if you divided this big triangle ABC into three small triangles by attaching each vertex to point P, uh, this is how it works. So basically the area, assuming that the area of the big triangle is one, the area W, area V and area U ratios are what controls the coordinate index values. So yeah, pretty straightforward there. So you can imagine if point P was moved all the way to point A, then the area of U would equal the area of the big triangle. And so the value for U would be one, and the value for these two, they would go to zero because those triangles would disappear if you moved point P to point A. So, yep, pretty simple. And um, why this is cool is because basically in this same equation, uh, is embedded what is important to us, which is basically that any information for which you have a definition of it at each of the vertex positions, uh, you can interpolate between those by using these barycentric coordinate values. And so let's say you want to average the color of vertex A, B, and C. Well, you could do that by taking the, you know, evaluation of this expression here. If you picked values of A, B, and C, uh, yeah, of A, B, and C basically to match your colors. Also for the depth. So, you know, if you go back to this and you compute the depth of a single point, well, um, you'll end up actually evaluating the depth of all three points of the triangle, and then you have to compute the depth of every point within the triangle. And so for that, you'd want to interpolate between them. So how do you compute those coordinates? Well. It's pretty 
simple, I would say, um, and the, the algorithm can be made very efficient, but the idea of it in general is this, and of course you can dig deeper and understand how you can make this more efficient, but um, you can kind of extend the idea of the triangle area ratios we just talked about um, to basically define the coordinate system. And so one thing that you might know already is that the area of a given triangle is half of the area of the parallelogram that's built from the same points. And so basically, triangle ABC, uh, if you were to basically mirror, or yeah, whatever, mirror basically vertex A across edge BC over here, that resulting quadrilateral is a parallelogram, and the area of that is double the triangle's area. Why is that important? Well, it's important because it's very easy to compute the area of a parallelogram, and that's just the cross product. So basically, AB cross AC, that magnitude of that cross product is the area of parallelogram ABC. And so if you wanted to compute the area ratio that W describes, well, you can just basically take the area of the parallelogram of a, B, P, which is shown here with this salmon color, uh, rectangle looking thing, uh, and divide that by the area of parallelogram uh, A, B, C, essentially, which is this larger gray parallelogram. And that's just basically this evaluation here, which is A, B cross A, P, divided by A, B cross A, C. And that's the definition of coordinate W, and a very similar one exists for uh, u and v. So you can very easily compute each of the three coefficients here of this linear e expression. And one other thing really quick is actually this numerator here, this cross product actually, is also a way that you can detect whether or not a point is inside the triangle. And we covered this in the other series, the, the CAD from scratch series. I'm not sure I covered it in this series yet, but basically if point P is to the left of edge AB, then AB cross AP will be in the normal direction of this counterclockwise triangle. So you kind of can use this uh, to also evaluate whether or not P is basically to the left of this line. And then what you would do to check if P was inside the triangle is you do the same operation for this line and this line. And basically if all those cross products evaluate to be positive, then you know P is inside the triangle. Okay, so what next? Well, how do you interpolate the depth? So you ha let's say you understand now how to compute the barrier centric coordinates for any point P. Anywhere, any point P in the plane of this triangle, you can compute you know, U, V, and W in this way. So what's the next uh, step to do? Well, what I did and what I think you probably should do, and there are other ways to do this, but this is one simple way to do it, is basically to define a bounding box for your triangle in the view plane, right? So you'll have basically an X prime and a Y prime for each of these three vertices. That, that would come basically from this math on this slide. So you'd evaluate X prime and Y prime for every point A. So each triangle has three point A's essentially. Then you take those three points and compute the maximum X and the Y values and get this bounding box type thing. And what you could do is just iterate through every single pixel in the first row of this bounding box and check, hey, are we inside the triangle yet? And of course, you could do this more efficiently. You might say, well, let's be smart about this. Let's guess something close to the first point, the highest point potentially. Sure, that would work. Um, but here's a very simple algorithm. So iterate through, and then once you've determined that you're inside the triangle, at that point, begin your interpolation, be it for color, be it for depth, whatever you have to do. Then you know, continue that process through the triangle until at some point you will leave the triangle, and at that point, just increment to the next row. You can skip all this dead space beyond the triangle's borders on the right-hand side, basically. So then repeat that for every single row, and you'll eventually pr 
you know, create this entire triangle, you have the opportunity to evaluate the depth and the whatever else you have to do of each point in the triangle for when you plot it to the screen. So here is the final algorithm. It's pretty simple knowing all that stuff. The first thing is to initialize your depth buffer, especially. So you'll need to have, in my case, 1920 by 1080 array, essentially, of some way of containing the depth. In my case, I'm using a single position four byte float. Um, then what you do is you'll iterate through all the triangular faces in whatever you want to draw. So in my case, it will be those cross and cube geometries, but it could be any shape. Then the first thing you do to save some time is just to skip any and all faces that are pointed the wrong way. Um, so facing away from the viewer. So in my case, I've defined all triangles counterclockwise. So they have a outward normal for counterclockwise winding or wrapping of the points of the vertices. So if triangle is the other way, I'm not going to draw it. So then the next step is to basically compute that X prime and Y prime for each of the three triangle vertices. So I'll have three X primes and three Y primes. In addition, I'll have a depth value for each of those values as well, because going back, you have to compute depth anyway to evaluate X prime and Y prime. So you might as well save the depth for later use for the depth buffer evaluation anyway. So yep, that's how that works. Then the next thing you do is you take those triangle points and iterate through that, basically that bounding box, computing the various centric coordinates whenever you're inside the triangle. And then you say, well, if the point's inside the triangle, then check the depth. If the depth is nearer to the camera, then the far field or the existing depth in that array already, then set the pixel color to what the pixel color that you want to set it to be is, and then update the depth buffer with the current pixel depth that you're working with. Then you iterate through all the points, iterate through all the triangles, and then you're, you're done. So there's no, no semblance of centroids of objects, no semblance of convex shapes. Um, things just work in this sense. Um, you know, if it fits, it shifts, just plug and play type uh, algorithm. So now into the example. So I have two examples here, one with a solid color scene and the one that you already saw with a, a gradient color scheme for each of those uh, geometries. So let's show this example again. I'll go back to example A actually, and I'll just render this here. So again, you see the cross in 2D, just looking straight at it. But once I move this view around with the mouse, you can now see that there's a sense of depth and a field of view. And as I move the cube closer and closer, it does get larger and larger relative to the cross in the background. And of course, each of the faces is a, a different color, right? So the top faces are all blue, green is the front, etc. So yeah, it's pretty cool. It works. There is obviously, I'm not sure you saw it, but there's a bug in the way this is currently implemented. I can zoom in and out, pan left and right. But one, one thing about this is you can see right here, um, because of the field of view, the algorithm that calls the face is based off the normal direction thinks that this face is pointed away from the viewer. In reality, it's not. So I have to fix that at some point, but for the time being, it gets the point across. Um, so how does this work? Let's take a look. Uh, let's look at everything. Okay, so Okay, so first I have a pretty large heap now because now I have to add one more thing to the list of things we have to keep track of. Yeah, there's a frame buffer. Yeah, there's an intermediate buffer um, because we're, we have a cursor on top of the screen that has to be stored separately. And also now we have the depth buffer. So that I think is like eight megabytes of space wasted in terms of storing the depth of the pixels on the screen. 
but yeah, besides that, it's pretty straightforward. Um, includes here, only a few. One is what we're using to draw the cursor. And we have two here that basically initialize and loop through our scene to render things every frame. So the same cross cursor example um, from the previous episodes. And uh, here's the entire program, just this start label. Basically, we initialize the 3D render, uh, and then we loop through every single frame forever. So again, we have this perspective structure um, as it was in the previous episodes. Um, only difference here now is that this last value, so basically we were storing the looking from coordinate, basically the origin, and then the target of our view, which was basically the middle of the cross, essentially, um, and the up direction defined here. And then we were also storing the zoom value, but now this zoom value more contains the focal length, that f. Uh, and so if you change this value, it will basically change your field of view. Um, and so it's the same kind of setup as before. We have these linked lists that contain other linked lists. Um, so we have this cross geometry that then points to the cube geometry. And so we're defining both the two geometries separately. Uh, and then the colors, you can see here, uh, well, the vertices are defined in these point arrays uh, and the faces are defined as basically with the index of the points and then the color we want to assign. So in this case, the bottom of the cube is uh, basically a red. So yeah, or bottom of the cross, I should say, is basically a red. So this is as it was before. Um, not too much has changed in this uh, assembly file. So when we initialize everything, how does that work? Well. Let me show you. The only thing that's different on this base, you know, compared to the previous example was the depth buffer. So we have to create a depth buffer. You can see here, I'm uh, basically looping through every single pixel. You can see here, I'm taking the frame buffer size in terms of its width and its height, um, and then dividing it by two because the frame buffer has a, an eight byte quantity for every single pixel. Whereas we're gonna use a single precision or a four byte float for each point in the depth buffer. So half the size, so that's shift right RCX2. And basically we drop in there um, basically negative infinity for the far field depth as an initial value. Uh, that's the main thing that's going on here. And uh, besides that, we're just kind of pre-computing some quantities that speed up downstream computations. So in this case, I'm computing, uh, you can see here basically the X prime and Y prime equations and so i wanted to pre-compute some values that speed up the later uh downstream evaluations besides that nothing really goes on in this file uh, then in the loop file this is what we're calling every single frame rendering opportunity um, again this is as it was before only difference being that now there is uh where is it a uh, sense of the depth buffer. So every single time that you rotate the model a little bit, or you zoom in and out a little bit, or you pan left and right a little bit, the entire scene depth has to be re-evaluated, right? You can't use the previous depth values because you've now spun everything around and things are in new spots and everything has a new depth. So every single time it has to render a scene, render a frame for the scene, uh, it has to reset the depth buffer to all minus infinity at every single pixel location. Besides that, it's pretty much what it was before. Um, and then, so I kind of refactored the way this is set up. Um, instead of having this built into those previous two files, I pulled out basically the logic that parses through the linked list of geometries. And so in this case, um, we're only rendering solid objects or basically sets of faces. Um, but that's what this set of code is doing. It's just looping through the entire linked list of objects that we're drawing, pulling out each face, um, or rather it's, it's sending them to another file, which is this function here. And this function basically computes the X prime and Y prime of every point in the triangle faces in that object that we just figured out was an object. And, uh, Based off the X prime and Y prime and Z prime, it computes the depths of all those points as well. And it passes that into this final function, which is actually 
what's drawing the pixels into the frame buffer. And so in this file, you have to pass in a few things. One is uh, obviously the same stuff as before. So the frame buffer uh, address, the width and height of the frame buffer, as well as potentially the color that you want to use to draw things, um, but also a an address of the depth buffer, because we have to check the depth at every pixel to see if the current depth of the current pixel can be drawn or not. And uh, on top of that, there's a Boolean here, um, which basically says, should I also be interpolating the colors? Because the colors could be a solid color for the face, but it could also be an interpolation. And we'll use that in the next example that I want to show you. But um, this is where all like the, the barycentric type math is located in this code right here. Uh, and you can see this is basically this least two loops, loop y and x are basically with things that loop through, I can even show you the bounding box of the triangle. And so it basically iterates through until it finally determines that we're inside the triangle. And then once we're in there, it begins to evaluate the coordinates and then interpolates, if it needs to, the colors. And it will interpolate the depth because it has to compute the depth to evaluate the whether or not it should actually plot the pixel. So a lot of stuff going on, but it all seems to work. At least most of it seems to work. So again, I'll show this example. It, it does seem to, to work pretty well um, with that one bug aside where you kind of can see here that green face on the cube is uh, <laughs> non-existent at some, some points of view. Okay, the next example is the same exact thing uh, with a gradient. So in this case, I have assigned basically a RGB value to every single vertex. And the only difference in this is, um, well, functionally speaking, as far as this file is concerned, the, the, the actual top level code file is basically just one thing. Well, I guess a couple things. One is, where is it? Uh, this bit, basically, um, this byte contains a different set of bits that define what kind of structure it is. So in the previous example, the, the byte code for the structure type was 100 binary. Now it's 110. Uh, this basically means, well, 100 means the faces were defined, I believe, by the solid. So basically, if the cube was all going to be blue, you would put 100 here. If it's uh, going to have colors defined per face, you put 101. And if it's colors defined based off vertex interpolation, you put 110. And so you can see down here, the difference is primarily that the points, the vertex locations, no longer are just x, y, and z, but now I also have an RGB value for each vertex. So that enables you to, you can even see here on the bottom, right? This vertex at the bottom left of the cross is blue and it's blue for both the front face, the left face and the bottom face of this cross. It's the same blue color that's interpolated from it in all three you know, planar directions. So yeah, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, I had fun making this, it took me a couple of weeks to get this working out. Um, but yeah, pretty cool. I have to fix that one bug. You kind of can see here, it still manifests even in this uh, example. Uh, but yeah, everything seems to work. There are some other problems with this, I'll be honest. Like when you zoom in and out a lot and move things around, sometimes it gets a little bit askew. The field of view gets a little bit wonky. Um, not really right now so much, but it does happen sometimes. And also as before, I think if you zoom out infinitely, you, you enter like negative space where everything is backwards and upside down, which is a, a feature, not a bug. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, with that out of the way, I think I'm done with the video. Thanks for watching and uh, have a nice day.